Welcome to Align Your Practice, an exploration of the seamless relationship between the business of chiropractic and the future of natural health care. Join us as we engage with an array of talent, from seasoned experts to passionate new entrepreneurs. Now, here's your host, Dr. Joe Esposito. Okay, welcome to Align Your Practice Podcast. This is Dr. Joe Esposito. I'm excited for uh, this episode to be here with Dr. Tabor Smith. How you doing, Doc? I'm doing great, and I'm honored to be here as well. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'm excited. We've known each other for a while, and uh, we've been through different circles. We have some exciting things we're doing together, and uh, I want to get one thing off the plate right off the bat. A production manager doesn't want me to bounce on the ball, so I'm just going <laughs> to bounce real quick. Get that out of the way. Okay. So <laughs> that brings good energy to the to the floor. A little bit of a little movement <laughs> is good. No, it's funny. I'm a, I'm a squirmer, so I, I don't sit still. So anyway, John Eric, that was for you. Um, so let's go let's go deep into this journey you're on. I, what I love about this story, Tabor, is a lot of people on this call, whether a chiropractor or uh, or, or just a journey of their wellness lifestyle, whatever they're dealing with. A lot of people just don't give up on the one thing that's frustrated them and they decided to make a stand, whether it be practice or a business venture or even a relationship. Sometimes we just don't give up, right? We just stick with it. And your story is cool because before we became friends, I knew what you were doing, but I really honestly, I didn't know how to take it. So your journey is in spinal hygiene. And I, I want you to tell all your... Um, I guess, uh, analogies like dental hygiene is one. Sure. Um, but, uh, I think you started early where it was like, what the heck is this guy doing? And mm -hmm. now I think it's the perfect time. And I don't know if you feel it, but I think there's less resistance to your journey. No, uh, I feel it definitely. And for me, it was a, a very personal journey. I, I, I find that, that some of the hardships we go through are actually good things. And for me, that, that turned out to be, I was a teenager and I had horrible lower back pain that would shoot down my legs. And that's how I found chiropractic. And they, they discovered a spondy, my lower back. Okay. Well, um, I mean, I was on every, I was on opioids at the time. This was like in, uh, uh 96, 97. Wow. Yeah. And the, of course they said opioids weren't addictive. Right. And, uh, I'm taking them as a teenager thinking this is just how life is going to be forever. Uh, and then, and then a chiropractor changed my life. I mean, totally, uh, was able to play basketball in, in high school and in, even in college, which I never thought I would be able to do. And it was just a no brainer for me. Like I thought who wouldn't want to be a chiropractor if you could help people right out of this misery. Um, and then for me, it was also like, I never want to be back in there again. What do I have to do uh, to make sure I never go back to that place and realizing that there was no information, you know, it was like, if you have back pain, you go to a chiropractor, but uh, in dentistry, there were things I was doing to, to maintain the health of my teeth and going in regularly for checkups and all of those things. And so as I was going through chiropractic school, I'm constantly learning because you have to take it back to what is a healthy spine. And really, it, it breaks down to three areas of health, alignment, motion, and strength. And those were three areas I started maintaining in my spine, regular chiropractic visits to help me do that, right? And then that over the last 16 years, has grown into me, um, my mission to educate the, the community, which then, uh, you know, turned into educating as many people and chiropractors as possible. And as, to your point as, uh, of it being the time to do this, it turns out that right now in our society, we have more degeneration, more decay. You mentioned the frustration in practice. The frustration is when, when someone comes in, they're 40 years old and they have phase two degeneration and we're never told that we could do anything about that. You could prevent that at all. Uh, and, and Dennis had this same frustration in their offices back in the early 1900s when it came to tooth decay. In fact, we just discovered the cause of tooth decay in the late 1800s. A, a, researcher, medical doctor, and, and dentist by the name of Willoughby D. Miller, he discovered the cause of tooth decay, that that bacteria builds up in the teeth, that it digests food particles, the bacteria digest food particles and secrete an acid byproduct. And then we now know that acid byproduct will then eat the enamel of your tooth and cause dental caries. That didn't change the fact though, that here comes industrialization, 
into our society, bringing massive sugar into our diet in the early 1900s. And then dentists were busy all of a sudden just pulling teeth. And so here comes uh, Dr. Alfred Phones, who we now know is the father of dental hygiene. He uh, grew up in a dental office in the early 1900s, and he saw his dad pulling people's teeth at younger and younger ages. Well, then he became a dentist himself, and he saw he's pulling teenagers, pulling teeth because they're rotting so fast because of all the sugar in our diet. So he turned his niece into the first ever dental hygienist. They started helping people take care of their teeth in the office and teaching them to take care of their he teeth at home. And we just think that, you know, dental hygiene exploded from that point, but it didn't. In fact, dentists fought the idea for a very long time because they thought we're busy. We're making a lot of money off of people's teeth rotting. Why would we tell them how to take care of them? You're going to you're going to put us into obscurity if everybody starts taking care of their teeth. Um, and then a lot of dentists actually literally there are quotes um, in some of the literature back in the early 1900s. that says, we just don't believe that you can prevent tooth decay. It's going to be too time consuming for people. They'll never do it. Um, and, you know, we hear a lot of this sometimes when I'm trying to share spinal hygiene is that, you know, my patients don't want to do it at home. They'll never do it. But you know what? Once you start implementing it, this concept in your in your uh, practice, you notice there are a core foundational group of patients who do these home exercises, and those are your lifetimers. Those, those are the people who value their spine enough to actually do something every day for it and come to you for checkups. It's like that dentist, their ideal patients, not the one that lets their teeth rot out of their head before they come in, right? Their, their ideal patients are the family that's like, I want my whole family to have great dental health and we want you as our dentist. And, that, and so that's the concept, the ideas that we're creating with the spinal hygiene movement because in today's society, technology, uh, all of a sudden we have kids that are on computer screens for seven to nine hours a day. Everyone's on a, on a, a phone. We're sitting for longer periods than we've ever, ha ever had before. We're seeing more and more degeneration around the base of the neck, C5, C6, more decay around the lower back, L4, L5, than ever before at younger ages than ever before. And there's no one that's going to do anything about that except for chiropractors. Yeah, it's interesting because if you look at dentistry back then that you're talking about, people don't realize that they were considered quacks uh, right. many years ago. I think it was more like the 40s or somewhere around there. I don't know the exact time frame, but they there was an actual article about them considered quacks. So interesting. it's interesting going from there to them doing emergency dental work, right? Uh, like us doing chiropractic handling severe low back cases or people mm. with severe uh, injury and then them start working into the resistance of dental hygiene and thinking it's going to destroy their business now the education finally became big enough that everyone gets their teeth checked if you don't it's off now it's like right. ah, dentists are not only so busy but there's 10 times more dentists and they're all busy mm. because now they're dealing with dental caries smaller ones they're saving teeth instead of pulling teeth, but they're still working a lot, you know what yeah. I mean? And getting great business venture and everyone has a dentist. So I think right now in Cairo was chiropractic's quackery in the 60s, 70s. Now every sports team has a Cairo, every musician has a Cairo, companies have Cairo. So it's now mainstream chiropractic. Now we're getting into uh, this little resistance for the last 10 years on the spinal hygiene from your movement. Now I think it's an accepted piece. Now we're going to start seeing the utilization of chiropractic climb and climb and climb to we, not, we may not have so much massive injury or need that we can't help them maybe go into surgery. We're preventing and protecting and keeping integrity of the spine. We do see degeneration. It's a beautiful state that we're moving into. But tell me what you think about from your perspective when people are doing spinal hygiene in their homes, their husband, spouse, friend, neighbor, kids are probably watching this and asking questions and seeing the book on the counter. And sure. it may start moving into this like, hey, maybe I should get my teeth checked for a cavity. Maybe I should get my spine checked. Do you think it's going to move into opening the awareness of chiropractic as a preventative nature from your perspective? 
that that it that's the vision and that's the the way it's moving right now and and that's where the evolution of of dental hygiene actually began right you know a few people started doing it but dentists have done such a good job they got into schools they started teaching kids how important it was and now they've done such a good job of educating the community that you should you should do prevention when it comes to to dental health that that the parents now do their job for them you know, I, I have three little boys and I took them all to the dentist early uh, every night. I'm like, brush your teeth before bed. Right. And uh, and so they they did such a good job of educating me that I now educate them. And so eventually we'll get to that point, too. We're not we're not there yet. Obviously, parents aren't doing our job for us. At least maybe some of us are in in our offices. Um, but uh, but yeah, I do think that's important. And then to the point that you just said, you know, if one family member is watching, can they do it? This is why our spinal hygiene movement exercises are what we call non-prescriptive exercises. So in our office, we might prescribe an exercise if a patient needs it. Let's say that you came in and I x-rayed you and you had a right translation on your in your posture or on your x-ray. I might prescribe a left reverse posture exercise for that. That would make sense, right? But that would be your prescription. And I would tell you, Joe, don't share that exercise with your wife because she doesn't need it. It might mess her up. But the home care kit that we get are full of non-prescriptive exercises, meaning everyone can lay on the spinal molding rolls. Everyone can do a range of motion stretch. Everyone can do a wobble disc exercise. Everyone can work with the resistance bands. So yes, it makes it so easy for the whole family to begin to jump in. If a toothbrush, if you needed a prescription for it, and it took an hour or maybe two hours to brush your teeth every day, you just wouldn't do it. It just wouldn't be economical. So we have to make sure that our home care recommendations are easy for patients to do. Sure, some of them while we're in corrective care phases might need some prescriptive exercises, um, but there has to be some general uh, education and exercises that's implemented as well, in my opinion. I think that'd be interesting if people are raised with spinal hygiene mindset, if, uh, if, P, if the 90% of your practice is wellness people that you're maintaining their, their spine, like you maintain the teeth. And once in a while you have a sport injury or you get a little back moving a couch and you need a more intense care, but it's not what it's been or what it is now, which is a lot of initial intensive care and sure. wellness is starting to grow. But can you imagine the change what spinal hygiene will do for the awareness of maintaining the spine using chiropractic? It'll be exciting. Awareness is key. Awareness is where we have to start, you know, and you look in the medical field, they start with awareness on everything they want to promote. Look at breast cancer awareness. Look at, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of things out there that they started with awareness campaigns to be able to build that. I give an example. It was I was looking through a Time magazine and they were doing they did a Gallup poll for some reason. They got they polled thousands of people, asked them, you know, do you brush your teeth every day? And 97 percent of the people they questioned said, yes, we, we brush our teeth. And I always say, like. That means that 97% of America is aware they should do something to take care of their teeth. Now, you might say, well, they're brushing their teeth to have good, good breath. And I would, I would say, yeah, that's great that you have good breath. But the ultimate goal is, is to prevent tooth decay. Like that's, that's really the real reason you would brush your teeth. You don't want cavities, right? Um, and so that awareness that of 97% of Americans brushing their teeth on a daily basis, you know what? That drives 50% of Americans to the dentist a bit because in the same poll, they said 50% of Americans have a dentist that they regularly go to or that they say they go to for checkups. Now, not 97%, not everyone who was aware they should do something has a dentist, but 50%, that's enough to catapult dentistry into the second largest healthcare profession in the world, right? Now, can you imagine, like, just look at our numbers. How many people do you think are aware that they should do something every day to take care of their spine? Yeah. which maybe we see 5% or whatever it is of the, of the population because of that. But what if we had 97% of Americans doing one thing a day because they want good spinal health? They were just aware. And imagine if that drove 40, 50% of Americans to a, a chiropractor. I mean, we would pass dentistry. We wouldn't have enough chiropractors to take care of people. That, that would be a great problem to have in my book. Yeah, and think about it. I know I'm speaking the choir, but just think about it. Dentistry is focused on making sure that these these bones in our mouth that are used for chewing to you know masticate and break down food is such a vital part of our hygiene of our body. And then this unit of bones in our body that's wrapped in five layers of muscle that's movable. 
The other ones aren't movable and has vitalistic nerves leaving between that, that control the human body. And we're ignoring this organ system, this spine, but we put all this attention on these bones in our mouth used to masticate because they look pretty or they help us chew, but they're not affecting neurology uh, as much. And, and when we look at the breakdown of the, when we look at the sedentary lifestyle of these, of humans and the positions that we're in, we're literally changing proprioception with this forward head leaning that our, our cerebellum's perception of normal is now this, and that's changing the disc, that's changing my breathing patterns. I'm breathing from my scalenes, not from my diaphragm. That's gonna break down my, my ability to get oxygen to my brain. It's gonna affect neurotransmitters, it's gonna affect my mood, it's gonna affect my relationships, my perception and my ability to see the world through uh, the right state of neurology. I know that sounds a little crazy, but the reality is there are a less, um, the experience of life is altered when you alter the spine, it's just, it's just reality. It, it, so, I don't know. I think what you're doing is changing the, the receptors and the perception, just reset, reset, reset every day. If we don't do that, it's just a subpar experience of life, honestly. <laughs> I mean, it, from what you just said, I would think we would have an easier uh, oh, time easy. selling our prevention than even a dentist would. Way easier. Right? We just have to all get on the story. And I, I love uh, anything I could do to help you in that. I'm proud that we implemented spinal yeah. hygiene in, in a line life in our national franchise. And it was not really grabbed on uh, in the beginning really well. And we just stuck with it. And now I'm saying, oh, you started a new clinic. Oh, you're using it. Oh, yes. good, good. Oh, yeah, no, I was looking for it. I'm like, wow. So I'm yes. seeing. And the reason I said that when we started the, the podcast was because that's what I'm seeing in our group is that there seems to be less resistance to people saying, oh, we should all do this. Right. Yeah. So I love the journey. Um, Speaking, um, if I can speak on that point, resistance is, you know, from this is why I started teaching when I started teaching the certified spinal hygienist program uh, through Life University, I wanted to really make a huge part of that program. What causes degenerative disc disease? Because that's kind of the pushback. Everybody thinks it's caused by old age. Even some chiropractors I talk to think no. Degenerative disc disease is caused by old age, when absolutely that's the least least likely cause of of this phenomenon that happens, right? I mean, we when we dive into it, we see that there's some genetic components, right? That your body might be more efficient at laying down calcium than somebody else's, uh, kind of like when we see obesity, their body might be more efficient at storing, uh, you know, adipose tissue than the next person, but they could still their actions, their daily choices can still influence whether they are obese or not, right? And so we have that same phenomenon when it comes to the spine that you, genetically you might be more uh, prone or more um, efficient at, at creating the degeneration or the loss of disc height, those types of things. But I, it really comes down to biomechanics. It comes down to Wolf's Law. When you start to put stress on certain areas, you see calcium lay down. And we dive into this in detail. So in, in dentistry, they looked and they said, well, if bacteria building up in the teeth secrete an acid and they cause uh, dental caries, then what if we clean that bacteria every single day, right? And we could, we could potentially lower risk factors for tooth decay, or you could just stop eating all sugar, right? And uh, they were like, those two things would be great, but it's going to be a lot easier in today's day and age for them just to brush their teeth every day. Well, we can say, look, if somebody had no postural stresses, they're never on a computer screen, they could do away with all phones, don't sit down for over 30 minutes a day, right? Like if you're, if you're perfect, you know, maybe you'd have this degeneration, um, but that's not plausible. What we can do is say, can we constantly check in and look at alignment, mobility, biomechanics, strength of the spine? If we're doing that consistently and maintaining that on a daily basis, we can lower the risk factors for degeneration. You know, it, it's really not even a question. Yeah. The, and, and, you know, on the, on the um, clinical side, you know, the disc gets its food from imbibition, which is mm. movement. It doesn't have a lot of blood flow. So without the sedentary lifestyles we live, which is getting increasingly worse, obesity is going up, degeneration is increasing, posture is getting worse over time, stress is increasing, that we, we have to make some decisions on what we can do three to four minutes a day, like brushing your teeth, same amount of time. What can I do real quick to get mobility? Because without imbibition, without pumping mechanism of the two vertebrae between the discs, 
we can't have that negative pressure to pull in nutrients into this. So what Correct. you're saying matches obviously physiology to a T and you're right. The story so easy to tell compared to dentistry, honestly, is harder. It's just well known to us. Right. But this story, Tabor, is so well conceived, I believe. So, you know, Align Life's implemented it. My, my statement to those of you listening, if you haven't implemented spinal hygiene, here's my advice to you, is that I would make it a commitment to your, um, to your new patients. I would actually make it a gift at like your workshop to say it's put it in the care plan. When you educate them, have them go back to the end of the room to get their spinal hygiene kit. And that's an opportunity to see if there's any questions they had on the workshop, see if there's anyone they want to get checked. So you need a way to transition someone from you laying down the premise, laying down the truth to taking the individual up to one of your staff to kind of see where are they at? Is there anyone that they want to get checked? So moving from our mindset or our premise to practicality for their business and for their, uh, their patients well-being, I think I make it a line in the sand. And we played with it in some clinics and then some clinics put in the line in the sand. This is just what we do. Yeah. I find in business, running a number of different businesses, the more I don't have lines in the sand, the more I got to make decisions, the more energy I got to apply, the more I got to think, should I, does this patient need an x-ray? Does this patient need, or I have protocol and say, you know what? Everyone needs spinal hygiene. It just makes the practice easier to run. So I would recommend that if you haven't spoken to Tabor, I know he's come to my organization to speak. You know, I'd love to send people to Life University to take the coursework, which I haven't done, but I need to do that. But any uh, closing up, any thoughts that uh, the practical thoughts I'm bringing, do you agree with those or anything you would add to that? No, I agree 100%. And, and really, it comes down to, we talk about knowing your product. And, and if our product is lifetime family wellness, the the core of that lifetime family wellness is lifetime spinal care. And if our mission is to educate and adjust as many families as possible, then part of that education is make is putting it in those protocols because you can't do that with one every single person that comes in your office you can't just say it all over and over again but this this lifetime spinal care education is built so beautifully into these products and into our spinal hygiene movement that once people are going through your protocols you're giving them the this, this spinal hygiene information they start to they they become understanders, right? We take them from believers to understanders where they really begin to understand what taking care of the spine is because nobody's ever showed them that, nobody's ever told them that. And those understanders then turn into your lifetimers and your best patients. And your ambassadors that spread the word of what you're doing. So I think it's probably one of the best business moves outside of direct marketing because it creates a daily awareness. When you go to the chiropractor and you only think about the chiropractor on the way to the visit or your spine, I think of my teeth a lot on the way to the dentist. I'm like, mm -hmm. uh, have I been flossing? Oh, yeah. Pretty good, but not great. You know what? You go through what you're supposed to do on the way to the dentist, right? That's funny. So if you're doing your spinal hygiene, you're you're thinking yep. uh, a chiropractor, you're thinking of integrity of the spine, and it yep. becomes a conversation more often. So I promise you, referrals go up and whatnot. So, yep. hey, listen, I really appreciate you coming on. And I really appreciate this mission. Don't give up, don't stop. And I know it's starting to get massive traction now. So congrats on holding to your, uh, holding to your vision, man. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. Thanks for helping me share the message. This episode was brought to you by Align Life Chiropractic and Natural Health Centers. If you're interested in creating your dream practice or want to know more about Align Life, go to alignlifepodcast.com.